So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Chava Fitzel. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Chaba Fitzel, and I will talk about uh, a couple of macOS persistent techniques. Um, I heard that I'm competing with some free beers, so thank you for showing up. Uh, I gave the title of Beyond the Good Old Launch Agents uh, to this talk, and you will see soon why. Uh, my name is Chaba, I'm working for Offsec, I'm the lead content developer for our uh, macOS control bypasses uh, training, which is basically all about uh, macOS exploitation attacks, uh, some pen testing as well. I also do macOS back hunting uh, in my free time. I used to be a red blue teamer uh, before, married, have two kids, and I'm really into trail running and, and hiking these days. Uh, so the agenda is, uh, I will go through uh, 10 different techniques uh, what malwares or attackers can use on macOS to persist uh, their binary. Uh, so the idea came, um, or, or a little bit history about uh, how this presentation born. Uh, back in 2014, uh, Patrick Wardle uh, wrote a paper and gave a talk about uh, malware persistence on macOS and uh, basically that was the most comprehensive uh, list of techniques um, about all sorts of persistence you can do on macOS. Uh, there is a guy called Adam who goes by the handle Hexacorn on Twitter and he has a really nice series, blog series, uh, about Windows persistence, and that's called Beyond the Good Old Run Key. Now, Run Key on Windows is the, probably the most classic persistence uh, you can have. And macOS Mover, 99% uh, uses launch agents. Launch agents is kinda your run key on macOS, that's the most classic way to persist um, anything on macOS. And normally, uh, if you have like a legit application, that's what you use to auto uh, start it normally. And I started to wonder that, okay, we have launch agent, uh, which is mostly used by malware, but can we do better? Is there anything else we can use? And then I started a series of blog posts uh, called uh, beyond the good old launch agents um, to mimic the name from from Hexacor. Uh, so the blog post currently has like 30 different uh, techniques and I selected 10 of my favorites, uh, let's say, or, or some of the more interesting ones. So the first one is shell startup files. Uh, these shell startup files or, or configuration files uh, will be started whenever a shell is launched, uh, like ZSH, Bash, SH, and, and so on. Like on macOS, when you launch terminal, um, then the default shell is ZSH uh, nowadays, but it used to be Bash uh, before that. So whenever terminal is launched by the user, uh, a shell uh, stream is start, uh, shell session is started, and some of the shell startup files will be read and executed. Now, there are many, many configuration files for shell environments, and uh, I find it hard to remember which one is read when, because it depends if you have like an interactive shell, then different files are used. If you have a login shell, then different, file be, uh, different files will be read. And, and so on. But probably uh, some of the most common ones are ZSHRC, BashRC, ZSH, ZSHNV, uh, ZLogin, uh, which is, for example, read uh, when you have a login shell, and so on. These are normally under your home directory, uh, but some of the global one can be found in the slash env. Um, directory. Obviously, you need to have root access to, to edit the global ones. Uh, now, the interesting thing is when terminal uh, is started 
on macOS, uh, the shared environment will inherit uh, terminals permissions. On macOS, we have this concept of uh, TCC privacy, uh, where you can genuinely control um, the application, what sorts of private resources can they access, like microphone, camera, documents, your contacts, and so on. These can be controlled one by one for each uh, application, just like on your iPhone, you can do it on a Mac as well. Uh, and there is a, a very powerful one called full disk access, when if you have that, you basically have most of the others as well. And typically, power users, developers, or, or just um, more advanced people we give terminal full disk access permission uh, for convenience uh, because they use it for many, many things. Now, if you persist through these startup files, your shell environment will inherit the permissions for, uh, of terminal and basically um, you will have access to all of those private resources terminal have access as well. And also if you manage to override that file somehow, that's also a sandbox escape because terminal runs um, outside the sandbox. Now, how we can detect this as, as blue teamers? Um, probably the simplest one is uh, monitor for the change of these files. Uh, there might be many false positives um, because power users might use it for legit reasons uh, to set up their configurations and etc. Uh, but still, that's probably the, the most obvious way, uh, way to detect these. Also, we can monitor for CSH, uh, CHSH execution, uh, which can change the default shell on macOS and also the chpass uh, executable. So let's go to the next one, which is the pluggable authentication modules, PAM. Now, PEM comes from Red Hat uh, origin, but nowadays you can find these on most Nix-based system, Linux, Unix, BSD, and macOS, because macOS is BSD, has some BSD origins. Uh, so this will work uh, more universally, just like the previous one will also work on Linux or, or other Nix-based systems. Uh, so PEM uh, allows you to install uh, external authentication authorization plugins which will be used by the system. Now it supports four different facilities uh, authentication, account, session, password management and so on and the configuration files for PEM can be found under the e slash etc slash pem.d. Now a configuration file looks like this uh, so the one on the screen is for SSH D, uh, the SSH daemon. Uh, sorry, there is one column for facility, there is one for the policy, and then there is one column for the actual module, which can be your own external module. Now the facility has various options, um, like that was the out account, and then the, the policy field can be set to required, optional, sufficient, and so on. Uh, that will handle the actual uh, policy differently. So if it's set to required, it will, uh, if it fails, then the result of the operation will fail. If it's optional, then uh, it will be ignored. Its result will be ignored if there is an other required one. Uh, a sufficient one, if success, then no further uh, policy checks will happen. And there is a default PEM permit, which is like success everything. Uh, so how we can persist using this file? Uh, again, we can use our own module, or if we like, want to backdoor, let's say sudo, we can just say, okay, um, PEM permit is sufficient, put it on the first line, and whenever we type in sudo, it will always success. Uh, but again, we can load our own um, 
And the reason we can load our own uh, library is because the services have the com upper private security clear library validation entitlement which allows them to lower to load external libraries how we can detect this uh, now first of all uh, i think since macOS big sur or monterey apple locked down these files so you need to have uh, some tcc bypass um, exploits uh, to to actually modify these files so only if you have root access you cannot change this file you need to bypass the privacy protection of uh, mac os to update them uh, but if you manage to do so uh, then again we can detect the change of these files um, the, there might be false positive but i think that's less common uh, probably these are one of events when you install a third party software for authentication or maybe an external smart card reader but that's not something that happens every day and also we can monitor for weird uh, dialips which are the dls on mac os or or just weird modules being loaded into ssh sudo or or any of the processes uh, that we can configure through pam so the next persistence is uh, Hammerspoon. Hammerspoon is, is a third party application, so it's not a Mac OS system specific persistence, but more like a, an application based uh, persistence. Hammerspoon, when we launch the application, we'll look for this uh, init.lua file, which is a Lua script and we'll execute it whenever the application is launched uh, we can basically call hs which is hammerspoon execute and we can put our in our own shell commands we want to execute and uh, they have more examples on their website what you can do with these uh, scripts uh, also hammerspoon has some really nice uh, entitlements uh, which allows it to access your camera, your microphone, and so on. Um, so if you inject anything into this script and launch Hammerspoon, the script will inherit uh, Hammerspoon permissions. And if the user provided camera access, then you can access the camera uh, from your binary. So it also opens the door for some uh, privacy bypasses uh, using this application uh, detection again changing of the init.lua file or simply looking for some weird child processes of, uh, of hammerspoon next one is preference panes um, Preference panes are those uh, basically plugins to the system preferences settings. So macOS, we have the system preferences or on the new versions, it's called system settings, where you can install your own uh, little plugin, which would normally allow you to configure or set some preferences to your own um, application. So this is a legit system functionality and you can place uh, we can also plant a malicious uh, preference pane in the library preference panes directory and that will be loaded by the system now the hard thing about this is that the user actually have to open uh, the preference pane in order for it to be started uh, so it's not perfect, but still it's an option. Um, we can create a preference pin bundle and in the init with bundle function, which we implement, we can put our own code and that's it basically. Uh, it will be loaded by the legacy loader uh, process. And yeah, and basically for detection, we can monitor for new files being dropped in the preference panes uh, directory, either in the user home directory or the global 
preference bins directory or looking for weird modules loaded by the legacy loader uh, process. Next one is uh, screensavers. So screensavers on macOS uh, have been very well documented by Leo Pitt Doomfist uh, in his blog post. And basically screensavers on macOS are other bundles uh, having the dot .saver extensions and they are placed under the library screensavers uh, directory and the system will read uh, the screensavers from there. Now, screensavers has many, many functions they implement. Xcode, the, the developer environment for macOS, has a, lot, has a template project for it. Uh, with pre-populating all the uh, all the functions, and basically we can put our code in in those functions in all of them or in in one of them, as we wish. Uh, basically, when the screensaver uh, window is uh, loaded or the preview, the small um, preference settings where you can see all the installed screensavers, then your uh, bundle will be loaded. <clears throat> and again, it will be loaded by the legacy screensaver process, uh, which is unfortunately sandboxed uh, with not too many writes. So if you choose persisting using a screensaver on macOS, it's, it's not perfect because we will not have too many writes um, as part of that. But for detection, again, we can monitor for the library screensavers directory or, again, files loaded by the legacy screensaver uh, process. I would also say we can monitor for new dot .saver bundles uh, just to see if the user downloaded a screensaver and, and so on. Uh, color pickers is the next one. Uh, what are color pickers? Now, when I first run into this or heard about this, uh, one, I had no idea what it is. The second, when I learned that, okay, I know now what it is, I didn't know that you can make your own, basically. So color pickers are these small windows where you can select a color for your font for your background or, or whatever, um, basically an option to choose a color uh, for whatever you need. Turns out that these are bundles uh, uh, and turns out that you can create your own color picker and they are located uh, surprisingly in the library color pickers uh, directory. And similarly to the previous ones, they are also bundles uh, having the dot color picker um, extension. Now, on macOS, all these bundles are, are directories with some uh, special files inside, including the, the binary itself. Uh, it will be loaded by the legacy external color picker service uh, process, and unfortunately, it's also sandbox. Uh, again, with not too many rights, so if you persist this way, you need a way to always escape the sandbox, uh, which is not convenient, but again, it's, uh, it's an option. Detection, just as the others, uh, we can monitor for new color pickers, or again, files loaded uh, by the legacy external color picker uh, service, or any new color picker bundle. Uh, I don't think that this is something really common. Um, when I tried to search for it, I found some really, really old GitHub project with simple code, how to write a color picker and what functions you need to implement. Um, I, I haven't found any anything recent. Uh, let's put it that way. Next one, the seventh is periodic scripts. Uh, one of my favorites, actually. Uh, this is, again, something that comes from the BSD, 
word. It has a free BSD origin, and that's where it came from to Mac OS. So these periodic scripts are maintenance scripts uh, executed by the operating system. They can run either daily, weekly, or monthly. Uh, for example, there is a maintenance script to clear the temp folder. So that's one example. Uh, but there are a couple of those, and they are organized to run, again, daily, weekly, monthly. Uh, it will be executed by the periodic bash script, which is launched by the periodic wrapper uh, binary. Uh, but eventually all of them have their own uh, launch the uh, configuration file. Now the periodic scripts are located under the etc periodic uh, directory and there is a daily, weekly, monthly subdirectory uh, with all the, all the various scripts. The configuration file the, the periodic script configuration file, the etc defaults periodic.conf, contains an additional location for periodic scripts, which is under the USR local etc periodic, uh, which you can also use uh, freely. Now, interestingly, up until macOS 11.5, uh, there was a local privilege escalation vulnerability. If you had uh, Homebrew installed as well. Homebrew is a packaging uh, utility for macOS, which allows you to easily install uh, various binaries um, through the command line. Like brew install your package and, and that's it. Just like on Linux, you can do apt get uh, install. Now, the problem with Homebrew is that it will set the USR local directory to be owned by the, by the main user. So you don't need to have root level access to put anything inside. But these scripts were normally run as root. So if you had Homebrew installed, you could put a script there uh, as the user, and that would be executed as root at one point in time. Now, what Apple did to fix it, uh, although it really wasn't their fault, it was really homebrew messing up the permissions. Uh, what Apple, Apple did is now they check the owner of the script, <clears throat> of the periodic script, and they will execute it as the owner of the script. So even if you are the user putting there a script, uh, it will be executed as the user and not as root. Now, uh, there are still options to, to persist using uh, other locations, using periodic scripts like the ETC, daily local, and so on. And actually yesterday I learned that the periodic.conf file is a shell script in itself. So you can change the config file put your own code and that will be executed as well. Um, so the config file is a shell script. Um, how to detect this persistence um, change or any new periodic conf file, change of any of the scripts, uh, any of the folders containing these scripts, uh, or just weird processes launched by periodic. So macOS comes with a set of these scripts, not that many, so you can easily build um, a list of what's normally being executed and basically anything else is likely malicious. I don't think that this is really used by uh, third party applications to put their stuff there. Next one is terminal preferences. Uh, terminal in its preferences contains uh, an option for a startup command, which is basically a shell command. So what you can do 
is whenever you launch terminal, you can run a custom command you want. This is a bit similar to the uh, shell startup files, but this is something set inside terminal's preferences. Uh, this command can be found in the terminal's preferences file, which is under library preferences com apple terminal plist. And basically you can put your own uh, shell command there. Detection, really the modification of this file. Um, uh, next one, emond, which is the event monitor daemon. Uh, there has been two very good work on, on emond or describing how it works and what it can do. Uh, the first one from James Reynolds and the next is from Chris Ross. Uh, it's a bit complicated uh, process and to get it to persist. Uh, basically, the first thing is that the event monitor daemon is only started if there is a give any file under the private var db, db emond clients directory. So first we need to put there a file because if we don't, it won't be even started. Next one, uh, we need to create a rule uh, under the etc emond d slash rules directory, uh, which the rule file will define what um, event monitor daemon will do uh, under certain events. So let's say there is a, a network event or there is a logging event or, or some startup event, uh, then we can set up what emon D will do in that case. So we need to create a new rule uh, for that. And also we have the emon D config file, um, which is not a script, it's a, it's a plist file where we can set uh, additional paths for, for the rules. Now this is how a rule would look like. Uh, this is a property list file, which is uh, everything on macOS is configured through plist files, uh, really, uh, which is either XML or binary format, but the XML is the more readable one. Uh, you can also get like a JSON output from this, but basically what we have here, here is we have an event type uh, startup. So that's when the system starts up. And then we have an action, which is a type of command. And we can say, okay, you will run a, a bash command as the root user. And we can give some arguments uh, to the bash command and that will be executed uh, when the system starts up. Um, since, since this is under the etc directory, all these rules and the configuration, obviously we need to have root uh, access. Now, detection wise, again, any, any new files on the emond clients directory, because that's the very first thing uh, we need for the process to even start. Uh, new or change of files in the rules directory, change of the config file, because in the config file someone can set additional paths for, for the rules, and again, child processes of emond. Now, this daemon is so under-documented and really no one used it, that it's simply gone. So in the latest macOS version, uh, Ventura, which came out last, October, this is entirely gone. Uh, so we cannot use it anymore. Um, and the last one is folder actions. Folder actions was first detailed by Cody Thomas for, for theming purposes. Uh, basically, uh, we can set up Finder, the default file manager in macOS, uh, to monitor certain folders and run a script or run an action uh, when there is a change or, or something happens in those folders. Now the scripts are located in the library scri scripts, folder action scripts um, directory. And the config file 
can be found in the forward direction dispatcher PLIS files. And this PLIS file, the, the proper PLIS file, is not nice. It contains other embedded PLIS which contain other embedded PLIS encoded. So it's like a pain to um, read it, but uh, it can be done. Now, the way normally user create four directions is through the GUI and when Cody Thomas documented this technique, he also showed it through the GUI, like how you can set up a four directions through the GUI. Uh, but I was really after like, okay, how can I set it up without any user interaction? Can it be done at all? Uh, maybe not because on macOS, many things that you can set up are tied to user interactions. Uh, so maybe it will not work. Uh, turns out we can do that. So first we, we will need to create the directory for the scripts. Uh, we need to copy our script, uh, script there, um, which is configured with, uh, to run. Then we need to make a directory, uh, which we will monitor or what we want finder to monitor uh, for us. And then we need to configure the preferences uh, for the four directions. Uh, now the easiest way is probably use a Mac device, uh, set up four directions and just copy that preference file to another one, uh, unless you want to deal with the plist and with the embedded plist with the embedded plist. Uh, so I found it the lazy way uh, of doing this. Uh, so once it's done, so you have all the preferences, all the scripts uh, set up, uh, it still will not work. Uh, we need to actually kick it in. So we need to open the folder action setup application, which will do some other stuff uh, to make it to start it, and we need to kill the four direction setup um, application. So we, we really don't need a user interaction. We need to start the application and then kill it because we don't want the user to see it uh, at all. Also, if our scripts want to do any privacy bypass, uh, it's allowed to prompt the user and what is nice is that the system will say that, hey, the folder action dispatcher what would like to do something um, and it will hide the script uh, behind, basically. So the, the user will not see the real uh, script or real process uh, behind the action, which is nice. Uh, detection any new or change files in the script, uh, four direction script directory, change of the four direction dispatcher config file. And all the, all the scripts are launched by the Com Apple Foundation user script, script service um, process. So we can monitor for those as well. Conclusion. Um, so although these persistent might not be perfect, so they are not as good as a launch daemon or as a run key on Windows because they are either sandbox. <coughs> uh, you need to be sandboxed. Uh, you need to have root access or maybe you need to bypass PCC for some of them, um, but they can still work uh, in many cases. And actually I mentioned that the, so yesterday I learned that the periodic com file is a script. Turns out that uh, the main page configuration file is a script. The SNMP configuration file is a script. And there is also another script uh, which is run by Audity. And since this stuff coming from the Nix world, so the Audity, SNMP, um, the main page. So these are all coming from BSD. 
these applies also to, to BSD, not just uh, Mac OS. Um, I think there is more to explore, um, but even today, uh, so I don't usually deal with Mac OS malware, but try to read um, the write-ups at least. They are still mostly using LaunchD um, to persist. But yeah. So yeah, if you are interested, uh, follow my blog. Um, I will post some new ones uh, next week with all these SNMP and and all these config files, which are really scripts, uh, which is nice. Uh, so that was all from me. I'm not sure if there are any questions. Thank you. Do you use any tool for monitoring all these uh, config files in the folders? Uh, yes, uh, there is a, well, not all of these, but there is a, a, a utility written by Patrick Wardle, who does a lot of macOS malware research, who did the original um, white paper on Mac malware persistence. And he has a tool called Block Block, which monitors many of these uh, locations for persistence and will alert you uh, in basically for all of these. Also, he has a, a utility called Knock Knock, uh, which, can, which will scan your Mac for not all of these, but for many of these uh, items. But this is you need to run it on demand, so it's not always on. Thank you. Anything else, anybody? If not, then Java, thank you very much. Thank you.